we knew from the beginning that the personal computer was the real computer. That was the computer that was going to change the world. But, you know, we're starting the Sinners program two years after the IBM PC came out. Remember, we're, we're, maybe the XT <laughs> was available at that time. The Mac was light years ahead of, of DOS on, you know, four color, black, white, magenta, and cyan. Um, and, and so we did a lot of work with the Mac but also uh, even DOS. So the first thing was clear is um, Unix wizards knew how to do telnet and remote login to bring remote computers up on your screen. But ordinary folks with Macs and DOS didn't have a clue. So that's why we developed NCSA telnet, which was software that allowed you to have multiple computer, remote computers open on your screen and doing remote sessions in them, uh, which is how you had to behave if you were going to be in a networked world. Well, of course, that was client server. And now, of course, that is the basis of the whole corporate uh, IT industry. But back then, it just seemed like the logical next step to us as we moved to a networked world. Um, we had this we'd make these pictures of the Macintosh screen with a little cray icon on the Mac, and then the title would be Hide the Cray. Now, this was totally radical. Why? Because we were taking the supercomputer and the mass storage systems out of Livermore and Los Alamos and essentially just literally cloning them. I mean, we were using the cray time-sharing system. We were using the mass store software they used. It was literally just cloned it. But at Livermore and Los Alamos at that time, you did the word processing and your editing on the Cray from a dumb terminal. There was no notion that you use the personal computer. There was no client server. There was just time sharing. So it was, it was very radical, actually. And, and I think the other radical thing was distribution. You know, we could have taken Telnet and tried to keep the intellectual property or do whatever, you know, tie it up, but instead we said, if we're just going to get anywhere, let's just give it to everybody. Now this was considered, again, kind of radical. Um, turned out that, that later on the authors of, one of the authors, Gage Paulson, uh, went out and started up a company, Intercon, which was later bought, and it was a successful private sector company. But we didn't let that interfere with our primary mission, which was to get out software to enable people to be better able to use high-performance computing than they would have otherwise. We invented the notion of, well, I don't know if we invented it, but we adopted the notion of putting up the um, software on anonymous FTP servers and letting people download it and the rapid prototyping that the world now thinks um, is the way to go. I mean, that was being done 12 years ago with Telnet. Uh, every time we'd come up with a new rev, we'd just put it up on the anonymous server. You want it, you'd take it down. If NCSA had decided, let's make a distribution unit in a warehouse, and let's hire lots of secretaries to take people's names and numbers, and let's charge for it, um, the internet would have been much more slow in coming because you know, many people, large fraction, probably the people that first got on the internet did so using NCSA Telnet. Notice that it was DOS and Mac users that required it. So what this did is, I think without NCSA Telnet, the internet would have stuck much more closely to its ARPANET roots. Namely, it would have been a Unix environment with a more wizardy kind of approach. What we did was broaden out the user base to include personal computer users at the beginning of the takeoff of the internet, um, or its handoff from ARPANET. And that, I think, had a lot to do with the culture of today's internet, which is that it's a broad-based, um, non-elite um, network. ARPANET was an ex extremely elite network um, with uh, wonderful people, uh, great visionaries that were involved in it, but it was very elite. It wasn't even the academic community, research community, much less everybody with a PC. So now Telnet essentially is client server, right? Um, NCSA image, which we did in the late 80s as we helped develop scientific visualization, developed a lot of the things that led to the day's special effects. 
In 87, uh, the head of my uh, computer graphics labs was Stefan Fangemeyer. I uh, did the first thunderstorm scientific visualization. Uh, well, Stefan was in charge of all special effects for Twister. Stefan is the person who Newsweek said when Jurassic Park came, first came out, Stefan was the person who brought the dinosaurs to life and gave them attitude. Now, attitude was something that Stefan had. And uh, I think that whole era is one that most people don't realize. Again, NCSA had a very um, pivotal, seminal role in. But what we basically did during that late 80s period was to make the world safe for images. What NCSA Image did was basically we said we want to build a world of infrastructure in which it's as easy to move an image around as it is to move a word. That was our design parameters. Back, and, and that's the way we talked about it back then. So that meant we had to scale the network, scale the disk drives, scale the compute power. We had to go to full color. When the Mac II first came out, 256 color levels, uh, we got 50 of them. Apple gave us 50 Mac IIs, which was like stunning uh, in those days. We were, in fact, were the largest funded um, group in the academic group in the country for the Apple Advanced Technology Group. IBM at that time was telling their customers, you don't need color. We've already provided it, as I said. You have four of them, black, white, cyan, and magenta. Why would you need more? So what we did was we took things that were on $100,000 computer graphics workstations of image processing that medical imaging people used, satellite reconnaissance people used, and we took all that, put it into software and NCSA image on the Mac. And so you could just move the mouse and do what it would take you, what would have otherwise cost you $100,000 to do, and you'd have to be an elite specialist. But again, it's taking things that elite people knew how to do, could afford to do, and making it available to the masses. So by the early 90s, the next level really was collaboration software. Again, something that the private sector is now beginning to do. Uh, NCSA Collage was Again, a cross-platform Mac, DOS, Unix, uh, synchronous collaboration environment in which you could have common whiteboards, color images, and a lot of what collage has still isn't in the private sector offerings. And that was like 1990, 91. In fact, I remember we had uh, a meeting in San Diego with a lot of the top government people. And we uh, did a live demo that most people that were in the room will never forget. We had people at Cornell, at Pittsburgh, at NCSA, and at San Diego, all on a collage, synchronous uh, link up from their workstations. And then we had a telephone conference call so that they were all uh, simultaneously talking. And then we had this projected, um, I don't know, probably a Mac, uh, onto the wall with the speakerphone. And what would happen is one person would bring up a whiteboard or they'd open up a color image and then someone else would draw a line across it and then up would come a sort of a contour map across that line of the image. And, and they were all in this conversation. And from where you were sitting in the room, it was all coming from this one speaker and one screen because everything was melded together. And all of a sudden, everybody got it. In cyberspace, distance doesn't exist. Everybody is in one point. And it was a whole psychological transformation that came about from, from that de demo. Well, one of the things that we had to do as we were developing Collage was not just be able to bring in remote computers, which Telnet let us do, or people, which the Collage synchronicity allowed us to do, but also documents. So um, we set up a team to go after what would be the right um, document retrieval uh, mechanism. And Dave Thompson, who was another one of our uh, undergraduate, um, computer science undergraduate guys, he um, 
found this thing called the World Wide Web. And that seemed pretty cool because it was not just documents, but it was hyper documents. Um, and so we put a team developing um, a module to go into collage, which became the Unix version of Mosaic. Uh, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina were the two Unix developers. And then we gradually developed Mac and, and um, uh, Windows versions. By then, DOS had gone to Windows. Uh, but again, what this was is client multi-server. And it got to pick up so much momentum of its own that it, it sort of got dislodged from collage and just became its own thing. And NCSA Mosaic, um, at the time it started, maybe there were, I don't know, maybe 100 web servers in the world, something like that. Um, we also, at that time, developed uh, the NCSA web um, server software, which until recently was the most used server software. And um, so again, we put it up on the Namas FTP, let people bring it down, did the rapid prototyping. And before there was any um, commercialization of it, uh, there was several million people around the world using Mosaic. And what it did is it set off a nonlinear growth curve that's continued to this day. Once you had an easy to use point and click interface to the World Wide Web, then people started looking at the servers. Until then, it had been mainly geeks looking at geeks. Um, and when they saw how cool <laughs> stuff looked when it was put on the web, people said, well, I have cooler stuff than that. I want people to see me. And so they got their copy of NCSA uh, web server, HTTPD, and put it up their own web server and, and started putting their own stuff up. But then there was more stuff to look at. And therefore, there was more reason to download the viewer. <laughs> and, and so it just got into this bootstrap. It was, in the end, all driven by nar narcissism. I mean, it's basically people wanted to put their own stuff out that people could see who they were. It was a very strange effect. And then gradually, um, without going into the details, roughly speaking, a lot of the Mosaic programmers went off and joined Mark Andreessen and Jim Clark and formed Netscape. Microsoft licensed, as did a hundred other companies, uh, the rights to use various things about Mosaic. And that led to the Internet Explorer and the two dominant uh, browsers uh, in the business. Mm -hmm.